announcements, guys, for, for those of you who missed yesterday. Uh, no final project. We know how hard this class has been for some of you. Take the time uh, this weekend to get through any assignments you haven't done this week, uh, this semester, uh, because we're going to be closing that mid-dead week. Okay? Uh, and today, we've got a super exciting lecture. Um, former BAB member and current uh, Cosmos employee, Sunny Agarwal, is going to talk to you guys about interoperability. There you go. All right. Hey, guys. Um, yeah, my name is Sunny. Uh, I was I used to run the R&D department of Blockchain Berkeley, and I started working on uh, Cosmos and Tendermint. Um, and so today I'll be talking mostly about um, interoperability, and I'll try to keep it very like general purpose uh, rather than focusing too much specifically on Cosmos. And I hope I can probably explain like what the relationship between like different interoperability platforms is, like Cosmos, Polkadot, etc. Um, and also. Um, Later at the end, I don't think this will take the full time. Uh, you guys can ask any questions about uh, any part of like the Cosmos stack or really anything with blockchains. I can probably help answer. Yeah. All right. So uh, you know, just a rough timeline, lecture outline, I guess. Um, okay. So uh, why interoperability, right? So if you go on like the Cosmos website, like it has the tagline is this like internet of blockchains and like you know it's a nice like marketing tagline but it's also like you know a very like specific uh design goal like when we were designing this stuff it was like intended to be inspired by like the traditional internet and so just how the like internet basically came up basically before the internet we had a bunch of like isolated servers uh and networks uh in like different parts of the country and like, you know, MIT would have its own uh, network, Berkeley would have its own, DARPA would have its own network, but, like, these things were not really, like, talking to each other or connected to each other. And then the internet was basically a way of saying, let's, like, create a common protocol and common stack that we can get all of these differing networks to be able to talk to each other. And so this is kind of, like, very similar to the state of the blockchain ecosystem right now, where there you have all sorts of, like, different isolated networks, Bitcoin, Ethereum, like, lots of different ones that don't have the ability to talk to each other. Like, most of these networks are decently good at talking within themselves. Like, the smart contract, like, interactions between different smart contracts on Ethereum are relatively, like, you know, okay. Uh, but, like, there's no way for me to call, like, a, use Ethereum to call a smart contract on, like, uh, Ethereum Classic, even, or Tezos, or et cetera. Um, so... And then you also get like isolated innovations where like the certain uh, chains um, are like innovating on certain topics, but only the uh, tokens that are based on that chain can benefit from those innovations. So if I want to use like zero knowledge, like based payments, uh, I basically have no choice other than to use like the Zcash blockchain. I can't like use my Bitcoin and like transfer it over as zero knowledge payment. Um, yeah, so the goal is that we want to be able to send these tokens across, like, different chains. And so what I mean by this is I want to be able to send my Bitcoin to the Zcash chain and use it, like, all the functionality of the Zcash blockchain, but with Bitcoin rather than with the Zcash uh, coin. And so this is, like, very different than atomic swaps. Atomic swaps are just this simple, like, I have Bitcoin, you have Zcash. I want Zcash, you want Bitcoin. Let's have a way of like swapping them at the same time to make sure both of us, n none of us can get cheated. And you know, atomic swaps are great and useful, but it's a kind of a very separate thing. I consider that more on like the realms of like exchange, decentralized exchanges and stuff. Um, this is kind of like what ILP and stuff is built around. But what we're gonna focus on is this um, use case where like you can, I wanna be able to do like this, user story basically like i imagine there's like a lottery right and i bet bitcoin on the bitcoin chain i want to be able to send my bitcoin to this like lottery chain use it like to gamble over there then i'll make a bunch of money and i want to move it to like a zcash chain where i can like send basically use zcash as this like mixer almost like to send myself the money over as an all transaction so it's like untraceable then I can move my Bitcoin to a DEX chain uh, where I can like trade it for whatever I want, a stable coin. Um, 
I want to make a bet with a friend, so I'll take my new stable coin, my DAI or whatever, uh, and move it to the Ethereum chain and put it in a smart contract. And we'll put the smart contract is like, can I get my crypto kitty to breathe an orange crypto kitty within six months? And so how I would prove this bet is I would take when it's time for like, there's a six month timer on the Ethereum chain, and then I have to basically send a CryptoKitty from the CryptoKitty chain to the Ethereum chain, and so I can show it to the Ethereum chain to prove that, look, this thing exists. And so the idea is like, the key one I'm trying to show here is like, there's a lot of use cases on where you want to actually move single tokens from like one blockchain to another. So I want Bitcoin to exist on like many different chains rather than just be confined to its uh, host blockchain. Um, and so, you know, the kind of like the first idea around the, doing this kind of thing was from Blockstream, a couple, 2013, 2014, uh, they coined the term side chains, which is this idea of moving tokens over from one chain to another. And, you know, I could walk through um, what a side chain is. Basically, uh, the, one of the earliest ones that I've worked on was, uh, it was a project called Peace Relay. Uh, it was done by like Loy Lu and uh, my friend Nate, and I was helping out a little bit. Um, and what you can do is you can, can think of it almost as like proof of, like you guys have probably heard of proof of burn, where I like burn a token on one chain, and then like in return I get a token on another chain. Proof of freeze and thaw is like that, but it's a two-way thing. So in proof of burn, I burn it here, and I can like withdraw on the other chain, but I, there's no way for me to go back because this money's been burned. You can think of freeze and thaw more like I freeze it, then I can like withdraw it on the other chain, but I can like get rid of it on the other chain and then thaw it back out here so I can get back my original coins. So an example of this is that I would take uh, my um, ETC uh, that's on, so this is how like Peace Relay actually worked. Um, so you take your ETC and lock it up on, in a contract on the Ethereum Classic chain. Um, then on the Ethereum, then so you know this, we can, you can have it like trigger a um, event, for example. I think that's what they're called in Ethereum still, uh, event. Um, and so then you can submit a Merkle proof to the contract on Ethereum and say, look, here's the proof that like I actually locked up my tokens. I froze my tokens on the Ethereum Classic chain. And the Ethereum chain would like verify that proof and said, okay, good, you actually did lock it up on the Ethereum Classic chain. And it will give me these ERC-20 tokens that are called, like, ETC. It's like ERC-20 ETC, um, which is representative of ETC. And then there are contracts on Ethereum that can, like, say we accept ETC as, like, the payment token. Um, then when it's time for me, I, you know, maybe I spend some of it. I, spent, I send 0.5 to someone else. Um, I have 1.5 ETC left. Uh, on the Ethereum chain, what I, what I can do is I can do a, this on this side it's a burn, where I basically send my ERC-20 ETC and send it back to the contract that I got it from on Ethereum that emits another event, and I can submit event of that th uh, to back to the um, contract on Ethereum Classic, and it'll give me back my original uh, ETC tokens. And so the, the key is, like, we don't want it to be giving me an ERC-20 ETC on Ethereum Classic. I want like the true ETC back. Um, so yeah, like you know, Peace Relay was super cool. Um, uh, it was a fun like summer project where like we worked on it for like a week and like didn't really touch it after that. Um, but some of the issues with it is that it was like very EVM specific. Like it was kind of designed for um, Ethereum to Ethereum Classic, um, and it was pretty complex and d doesn't work in a very general purpose way across many different chains. And so just like the traditional internet, the goal was to create a standard protocol that can um, be like embedded into every architecture rather than trying to create translators between every um, existing system. Uh, we want to create, we don't want to like say like, okay, we need to create a special system for EVM to EVM, a special system for EVM to Bitcoin script, a special system for Bitcoin script to like, Michelson, um, we want to create like a standard protocol. So this uh, this piece relay thing is not that great because it's very EVM specific. Um, it doesn't handle edge cases. 
Uh, because like, let's say they're, like sometimes you want to do things that are more um, complex uh, than just like, for example, maybe you have a number of tokens you or transactions you want to send from one chain to the other, but you want to make sure they happen like in order. You don't want uh, like tr transaction number three to go to be relayed over before transaction number two. So you want to build in like logic to uh, handle these cases. Um, it doesn't come, on, come like this kind of relates the last, the third point kind of relates to point number one where it doesn't come define any common standards for how to parse packets because that's what like IP basically is it's like defining a standard packet uh, structure that everyone ha and it says everyone you have to understand this one um, and you know it doesn't do that right now it kind of was just based off of proving something in the EVM state without any specific like formal spec of what that is. Um, and then the big thing is that light clients for proof of work are very computationally difficult to implement, uh, especially on Ethereum. Um, and so what the light client is, is like I need to be able to, um, how do I prove to the uh, Ethereum chain that I actually locked up my tokens on Ethereum Classic? I need to submit to it the block headers, show it that this block header is valid by like showing that all the proof of work is done on it. And then I also need to do a Merkle proof to say, look, here's that event in that um, Ethereum block header. Um, so the problem, by the way, if anyone has any questions, like please raise your hand and interrupt me because it's easier if I answer questions before than later. Yeah, if you're solve your confusion earlier than later. Um, so one of the problems with these proof of work like clients is that uh, proof of work like clients are very, uh, you know, very expensive. Uh, let's say I run a non-mining full node, or I run a light client on my like phone, right? And I let's say I turn off my phone at night. Um, that means that overnight I would have gotten almost like 144 Bitcoin blocks. Um, if I want to, and I turn on my phone and I sync those 144 blocks. And, but also then to check every single block, I have to do a hash on it. And, you know, SHA-256 is a relatively cheap, uh, very very cheap uh, hashing algorithm. And But even my phone can only do about three to four SHA-256 hashes per second. So that means just to verify these 144 headers, uh, that would take like a minute at least. Um, and, you know, it gets even worse with like something like um, Ethereum or Litecoin, which use, like Ethereum uses 15 second block times with like ETH hash, which is a extremely expensive uh, hashing algorithm because it's designed to be ASIC resistant. Um, and so, you know, I will get like on the scale of like 10,000 headers overnight in like 12 hours. Um, and so to do all the work for like salt to the verifying all those 12,000 he headers is like very expensive, especially if you want to do it on chain. Um, you know, like, this is kind of like what the entire, it's funny because, like, Trubit actually came out of this entire idea where they wanted to, uh, verify Dogecoin headers on the Ethereum chain, and they, like, originally wrote a smart contract to, like, verify the Dogecoin headers, but then they, it turns out, like, it's just so gas expensive, they're like, okay, we need to figure out how a way to do this, like, off-chain, and that was kind of like the, how, or, like, Trubit, like, originated because they wanted to solve that problem. Um, what we have, well, uh, I mean, you know, Trubit's cool and stuff, but, uh, I think the better way to solve this problem is to create a proper consensus algorithm that's, like, well-designed for like client proofs and doesn't require doing, like, a, uh, a hash, like, every single block. And so this is kind of where Tendermint, uh, comes into the whole, uh, Cosmos, why Cos, one of the many reasons that Cosmos and Tendermint are so, like, intricately linked. Um, so, oh, okay. Um, so the reason in Tendermint you only have to, uh, you don't have to verify every single uh, header is that in Tendermint all of the validators um, sign every single block. So like there's a validator set for that uh, block and you can consider this almost like a root of trust where you say, okay, at, at time, like, zero, 
I I trust validators A B C D because I've seen that they've all been they're all like staked and they have uh, it could be like private or public in a public system you use it with proof of stake and private you just say these are my original trusted entities um, so at time A uh, time zero you might have my trust like A B C D you go offline for a very very long time and you wake up and you know if the validator set is A, B, C, D still, you say, look, okay, at least two thirds of my original trusted validator set are in this new trusted validator set, uh, are in this new validator set I'm, I'm getting. And since my entire trust assumption is that I trust two thirds of the validator sets in my original, I can trust this one because at least two thirds are in this same, uh, in this validator set as well. Um, so yeah. Okay, so, but now what happens when you, um, yeah, what happens if you wake up and, like, it doesn't have the same validator set, right? So, what happens if you, uh, okay, yeah, so let's say, uh, this second block, like, wasn't there, this, uh, ABCD one. Let's say you woke up and, like, this is the validator set that you wake up to see. You wake up and see um, ADCF. Oh, wait. Uh, fuck. Okay, no, that's not a good example. Um, okay, the issue is, like, what happens if you wake up and you see that the validator set has actually changed by more than one-third? So the validator set you woke up, you last went to sleep um, seeing. Like, so at 6 a.m., you turned off your phone, and you had that your the, you saw the validator set as A B C D. You open up your phone at twelve o'clock and you see it as A B E F, right? So A B is still the same, but like you know both C and D are gone, which means that like you don't two thirds of the validator set is not trusted anymore. It, more there's been a more than one third change, and so what you do is you do this like bisection and you you go and ask, okay, um, you know. There was a bunch of blocks in that time. Uh, so you say, okay, uh, this is my trusted one. This one is not, this is like the most recent one, but it's changed by more than one third. So I need to basically do a, like, I'll ask the person, the full note I'm thinking from, I'll say, okay, can you give me the middle block uh, from like, in this from the time that I was offline. And so if this one is A, B, C, D, this fifth one is A, B, E, F, uh, but this one, the, the middle one happens to be A, B, C, E. So you can't do the direct jump from here to here because it's changed by more than one third. So you say, okay, give me that midpoint. And you say, okay, look, here I have at least two thirds of my original trusted set have, are part of this set. So now, if two thirds of them agree to this, this is my new trusted set. So now I have A, B, C, E. And then from here, now I can say, okay, A, B, and E are trusted. Therefore, I, two thirds of the trusted set is still in here. And so then you can do the jump. So you can basically do, if you take this like midpoint and reset your root of trust that way, you can do a light client sync in very few blocks. Um, if the if it turned out that like this one, uh, it did actually change here as well. Uh, if there's something else you didn't trust, A B G E, then you would say, okay, let me ask the middle one here and see um, how you can to make sure it did the jump properly. And so because the validator set can't change by more than one third in a single block, kind of what. <laughs> Technically it can, but it's like much more complicated the reasons it can, so I'd rather pretend it doesn't. Um, uh, yeah, and so that way you can always find like in a very few, like in your maximum is probably going to be log n. Uh, in log n steps you can find a, you can sync up to the uh, most recent block since the time you turned off. Okay, does anyone have any questions about that? That was kind of complicated and I'd, I'd like to explain that if needed more. Okay, I don't believe you guys. Um, 
checking your validator hash. Um, okay, so you know, that's great. Um, if we can do these uh, light client proofs very efficiently, checking a validator hash, like, log, uh, like a light client on, uh, a tenement light client is also much like conceptually simpler. So in proof of work, light clients, like, uh, like sidechain light clients, you have to like keep track of like, you know, the recent, most recent block is not finalized. You may, you need to be able to like handle reorgs. So if the, you know, you're two blocks deep and you, you see a giant reorg, you have to make sure you have to set like some pseudo finality threshold and stuff. Nice thing about tenement light clients is every block that you see um, is, if, if, if it meets it two thirds, it's a trusted, it's like finalized. Uh, so this means your logic of not having to deal with reorgs is much easier. Checking, verifying them is very easier. It's much easier. You can like consider the checking if of the signatures. It's like not that different than writing a multi-sig wallet. Uh, it's basically a multi-sig that's controlled by the validators of the other chain, and two thirds of them can like agree to like change off ownership of that multi-sig contract. Um, yeah, and so with this, you now if you have uh, two chains that have Tendermint light clients for each other, you can now prove anything about the state of one chain to the other chain. Um, yeah, and so what we call this is, a, in our system, we call this an IBC connection. This idea of two chains is basically sending uh, their headers back and forth to each other and like verifying their headers. Um, yeah, and so with this, you can basically prove anything about the other chain because the header should have like the transaction tree in it. So you can see all the transactions. It should have the state tree so you can prove anything about the uh, state of the other chain. Um, in Ethereum, it includes the like uh, event try, I think. So you can like uh, prove those as well. You can basically prove anything with like a Merkle proof um, about the other chain now that you have an a light client and you have like a verified header from the other chain. Um, right, and so basically now what we have is you have these two chains that basically want to like relay these headers, uh, like do be light clients of each other. Um, someone actually has to like pass the headers back and forth and like actually submit them as transactions. And so we have these things called relayers, which are basically just like people I'd be running software and say, I mean, I will, I'll like relay transactions between these chain uh, between these chains and I'll relay headers between these chains. Uh, one of the relayers will like see it and be the first to submit it probably because they just paid a higher fee. Um, and once that once like that relayer submits the header of chain A to chain B, B can now verify the headers. Um, and you know this is the base layer of IBC. this is how connections work. And you could theoretically start building like anything on top of these, um, but to make it simpler, we've created a another abstraction layer called um, channels. Um, and one thing is, by the way, these relayers should probably be incentivized. Uh, you know, we we haven't quite worked out the economics of that yet. How to uh, incentivize them? The idea is hopefully you'd probably like include a packet. You would include a fee ma fee payment in the. Uh, packets that you're relaying and whoever relays it gets to claim those fees but that's still yet to be seen um, for now um, okay so yeah connections are just these two-way block header transmission buffers and you know you can just think of them as just one giant pipe which you're like uh, throwing everything down but what we really want is an additional abstraction layer where which we call um, channels um, and what these do is they uh, transmit a certain type of um, data. So, one second. You can think of them like almost as like network ports. So, if you think of like uh, IBC, these like block headers, these IBC connections as I, the IP layer of the internet, where I'm I have my IP address, I'm connected to your IP address, and we're like, you know, have the ability to send. Uh, packets of some type to each other. But we, when we connect to things, people over the internet, you don't just connect directly to their IP, you usually connect like a, a specific <coughs> port of mine to a specific port of yours. And what this does is like, you can do like different types of connections over different ports. So I can say I will connect my, my like 
port 100 to your port 100 over TCP, but I'll connect my port 200 to your 200 over uh, UDP. And so these channels are sort of these um, abstractions of these like TCP or UDP, and it's basically different ways of how to handle a incoming packet. So, you know, there are some use cases where maybe you don't care that things happen in sequence. It'll kind of analogous to UDP. Like, I just want to send data from one chain to another. I don't, ex like, it's an oracle or something. I don't care that the data arrives in order, per se. I just care that, like, you know, if the other chain doesn't get it, like, whatever, someone will just, like, rebroadcast it again. But maybe if I'm doing, like, contract calls, I want to make sure, like, I all the contract calls get, like, if someone get like, sends an outgoing contract call, they should get processed before like someone else. Um, you can make sure they all happen in order. You can have it such that if one of them like fails, uh, no one else after them in line can like get through. Maybe this is like useful in some cases. Maybe you can have it such that if one guy is being censored, his thing will never get over to the other. Like he'll just get dropped, but everyone else can still like take turn, like still try relaying. These are just like all different like, you know, interchain policies that are kind of really up to the blockchains that are implementing it to choose what types of channels they find useful for their uh, use cases. Um, and you can use these for like parallelization. So maybe within one blockchain, some types of things should uh, be using TCP, but in parallel, you can be doing another thing that's using UDP. Um, okay. So I will talk specifically, you know, the UDP one is kind of like, you can imagine it's somewhat trivial to implement where it's just a one way thing. Like I, I have something, I have, a pack, I have some data in my uh, chain. I can just send you a packet and the Merkle proof to it. And I don't need to re expect any sort of like responses or anything. I just, in fact, once I send it, it's good enough. Um, if I want like a TCP style system, what I would do is I want to like make sure, like be guaranteed that my packet was actually received on the other side. Um, and if not, I can have some sort of fallback. So that way, you know, I have my users, they want to send a token, their Bitcoin from the Bitcoin chain to Ethereum. Um, what I want to happen is that if my token, if let's say they're being censored on Ethereum, I don't want like I, I don't want their tokens to be like frozen forever. I want them to be able to say, okay, the Bitcoin, the Ethereum blockchain has like censored us for the last like, you know, one hour. Like their tokens still haven't showed up on the um, Ethereum blockchain for some reason. Let me allow my users to like um, exit back on the uh, Bitcoin blockchain. They can still get their tokens back if they're being censored. Um, so this is like what the TCP model allows is we have two queues, uh, an egress queue, an outgoing queue on the sending chain, and an incoming queue on the receiving chain. Um, and so what would happen is a packet comes in and gets put into the egress queue of chain A. Someone relays a header, uh, relays a packet from A to B proving that look, this packet is sitting in the egress queue of chain A. It will get added to the incoming queue of chain B, and someone will submit a proof of that to chain A. Um, once, once it receives that proof, it will pop it out of the outgoing queue of chain A, and that will get, a proof of that will get sent to chain B, and it will pop out of the ingress queue of chain B. Um, what this TCP, like, it, it basically modeled exactly off of TCP. Um, and what this allows is that, you know, if there's some sort of like timeout where um, you're like waiting for an act back and you, you see that it never got onto the other chain, it's a way of like making sure that other chain is like still live. Or because if that chain is just like, you know, a dead chain, it's not all the validators went offline for some reason. There's a way of like getting your tokens, not, not like, Everything it'll the idea here is that nothing will ever ever get caught uh, mid transit. All tokens will like be on one chain or the other, and they won't be stuck in in flight for infinite time. 
Um, so, now, continuing with the internet analogy a little bit more, um, on top of, so, what, now that we have this, like, TCP over IBC, we have, um, complete, like, ability to send any sort of data between these chains, have, like, verified, um, like, receival of the, of the packet, so we know that the other chain did, in fact, receive it. Now we need, like, different protocols for how to actually transfer the data itself. So, you know, over TCP IP, we have, on the internet, we have things like HTTP, which is the web protocol, SMTP, which is the mail transfer protocol, uh, FTP, which is the file transfer protocol. We have these, like, different protocols that run over this um, TCP IP system. TCP IP system. Um, so the analogy for this in IDC is like there are different types of data that we want to send over uh, IDC. So we might want to send over like tokens, and tokens would have its own like format of the data. It, maybe it'll have something like it'll the data would be who is the, to the token coming from, who is it going to, what's the amount, what's the name of the token that's like being sent over. So. Um, you know, that, this is like the standard format for token transfer, but maybe for a non-fungible token, it might want a slightly different uh, data format. Or maybe for a cross-chain contract call, it would have a different format. And so basically, these are just sort of um, standards. You can think of them almost like ERC, like ERCs. So you have like ERCs like uh, ERC20, which are like a token, tra it's a token protocol, uh, 721, I think, is the non-fungible token one. Um, so you'll you will basically like see like these community-driven ERCs or Cosmos improvement protocols or something uh, where like we build these common IBC standards. So you know, here's a standard for if you want to build a token transfer protocol or receive tokens from other chains, implement this format in your chain. If you want to receive non-fungible assets from another chain, implement this like a handler to understand this uh, format into your chain. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, this part's complicated. I don't know if, any, if anyone wants me to talk about this. I'll come back to it. But it's about how we actually measure the timeouts. Um, yeah, that's too complicated. Uh, uh, okay. um, and so a hub, right? So what what so you know we have this like TCP/IP thing. Uh, why do you know if you if anyone who's heard of like the Cosmos project, they've probably heard that we're working on a project called the Cosmos Hub. And so if I can connect like any two chains using this uh, sidechain protocol, why would I need a hub of any type? I'll just connect Bitcoin to Ethereum directly and Ethereum to X directly, and right. Um, so, you know, the same thing goes with the internet. We technically, you can technically connect uh, by TCP IP to basically any other, uh, any other, if you can connect by IP to any other uh, server in the world. But you, what we usually do, the internet is based off of this very hub and spoke model where you have these ISPs. So if I want to connect to someone else, I don't connect directly to them. We don't really have like mesh nets in the real world. Hopefully, like oh, we, we don't have them yet, and hopefully, you no, know, one day we will. But for now, what I do is, if I want to talk to people, I connect to Comcast, and Comcast will connect me to other people who are connected to Comcast. And in case I want to talk to someone who's not connected to Comcast, they'll figure out how to talk to the other ISPs. So it'll go from like a my 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 router to an ISP to an ISP to the other person's router. And so you know, the Cosmos Hub is sort of just like one hub one isp in this like internet of blockchains um and we expect there to be many more hubs that pop up over time like you know you can consider polka dot another isp in this internet of blockchains you can consider uh like plasma or like ethereum maybe as another hub because you're gonna probably gonna see a lot of plasma chains going off of there um yeah, and you know, it also it the reason we have these ISPs, these hubs, is for efficiency reasons. Like in the with the internet, it's very uh, expensive and infeasible to actually connect 
with a direct link to like everyone to create these mesh nets, which is why the ISP model is kind of what ends up na happening naturally. The same thing's gonna happen with the hubs where, you know, if every chain were to connect to every other chain, that would be N squared connections. But if everyone connects to the hub and the hub connects to everyone, that's on, that's on an order of N connections. And it just makes the uh, entire system much more efficient and stuff. Um, the hub also, you know, the other thing it does is it makes sure tokens, uh, chains don't double spend other chains. So, you know, I can give an example of this. What this means, Bitcoin was designed to like keep people from double spending other people. The hub keeps chains from double spending other chains. So if I was, um, okay, on Ethereum, right? I got a, to someone sent me a Ether onto the Ethereum Classic chain. So I have this ETH on the Ethereum Classic chain. But you know, those Ethereum people always hard forking and like doing illegal, evil stuff, right? They might just hard fork and like change it so that they never sent me that uh, Ether to Ethereum Classic. And now they say that like they sent it to someone else on Bitcoin. They're basically trying, trying to double spend by changing their own state. What the Cosmos Hub will say is, oh no, wait, you can't do that because look, you Ethereum, you only have like this much Ether. You already sent like this much of it to um, to the Ethereum Classic chain. You can like that. You're trying to send more than you actually have, and it's a way of basically the hub will basically not Bitcoin because it'll be connected to the hub. It won't res accept that ether from uh, the Ethereum chain because it, it will know that it's like doing something fraudulent. Um, and, you know, the hub will also provide other services as well. So just how, you know, ISPs, they often provide a variety of services like cloud hosting, DNS, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, we'll see ISPs and hubs provide other services. Like the analogy to cloud hosting would be this shared security model where, like, I want to make a blockchain and say, I don't want to find my own validator set. I don't want to like do my own uh, token sales yet, like proof of stake tokens, something. I'll just give it to the Cosmos Hub validators and let them validate it for me. You can consider this like cloud hosting. Uh, you can probably get it'll the hub will probably do like DNS style stuff. What that means is like I don't know identity services and there's a whole plethora of things that like hubs will sort of be competing on uh, on these like features. And this is what like if a chain wants to connect to this like Cosmos ecosystem, it'll find a hub to connect to and they'll be competing under these different features, basically. Um, another thing I don't really want to talk about is Peggy, which is, you know, all of these IBC stuff were based off of Tendermint chains because of all the reasons that I mentioned, how Tendermint is really well designed for interchain communication. But unfortunately, we're left with this like circumstance where most of the chains right now are not Tendermint. Um, so, and we don't want to like leave out the, the, what I'll call legacy chains. Uh, so Bitcoin and Ethereum and stuff, like they're all stuck on proof of work for, for the foreseeable future. And so Peggy is sort of this way of like getting around IBC to like have it be able to connect to, uh, proof of work chains. Um, Yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Um, I'll take questions on anything now. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. Timeouts. So, what happens here is that in TCP, what, like I said, so if you sent a packet, uh, it's in your outbound queue on chain A, and you know. You, it, you never see that it gets into inbound queue of chain B. That you want to at some point like error out and like fall back and give back those tokens that were stuck like in the outbound queue. Otherwise they'll be stuck in flight. Um, but how do you measure this time? In TCP it's pretty simple. You just base it off of like what I think the time is. I think that, um, you know, I think that it's been like 30 seconds since I received, I haven't received an, received an act from the other guy. It's been 30 seconds, let me air, time out now. Um, 
in these distributed systems, we don't have this nice clear cut concept of time. Like a blockchain doesn't know what the current time is because it's not a single user and you know, you guys probably understand this. Like, you know, we don't have perfect timestamps um, in distributed systems. So what we do is we use the blockchains themselves as timers. So we use like the ticking of the blocks as this like, as the time steps. Uh, and so, you know, there's two blockchains involved here. We can either use our own blocks as the time steps, or you can use the other guys, the other chain, the receiving chains blocks. Um, I don't want to explain it now, but if you try to use your own blocks, it gets into the situation where you might accidentally double spend yourself, where you say, um, I sent tokens to the other chain. Uh, I'm like five blocks later, but I haven't seen something, haven't seen, seen an act, so I'll like exit out. But the other chain actually did in fact receive it. I just hadn't seen that. So what you really want to do is you want to use the other chain as the uh, time steps. So what that means is if you have a packet that's in the outbound chain of uh, outbound queue of chain A, and the t block number currently on chain B is block 11, right? And you say, I'm going to put a timeout for five blocks, um, which is like, yeah. And so what you'll say is, if, some, if it does successfully get into the queue of chain B within five blocks, someone will submit that act to you, a proof that's saying, look, it's in the, in, it's, it's like blocks 14 and it's in the inbound queue of chain A, you can pop it out, so you're in a good state. Um, but the nice thing is now you can have verifiable proof that like a timeout happened where someone else can, someone can say, look, it's block 18 and your packet is not in the inbound queue of chain B. And that you say, okay, it's been more than five blocks since I started, um, and he st that chain still hasn't received it yet, so let me just drop this packet and like return the guy's money because his packet's clearly not going through for some reason. Yes? So would chain B not accept packets that are past the timeout? Yeah, so, th so in the channel definition, when you set up the channel, uh, both chains should agree on like this is the timeout that we're going to be using. So the packet should have the time, the chain, the the packet itself should say at what um, uh, block number it sh it's going to time out at. So the other chain, sh if it if the packet says I time out at block eighteen, the other chain's on like block twenty when it receives it, it should not accept that packet. Yes. Um, sure, so Trubit and Tendermint are like very different things. Uh, Trubit is this way of like, I'm not sure if you guys went over Trubit, did you? Uh, not really. Oh, okay. Um, Trubit is a way of like basically saying, I want to do some very heavy computation uh, on the Ethereum chain, but it's not very, you know, it's too expensive for now, the reason it's expensive is you're basically forcing every computer in the world or who's running the chain to run the same operations. At the core nature, Trubit is just a hidden way of saying, um, instead of requiring everyone to do it, I'll just ask these like five people to do it and they'll all put down like some more stake and if the five of them agree, then you know everyone else will kind of like say, fine, these guys put enough like stake on it will go with it as well um and it's a way of like off doing off-chain computation but like secured through like economic incentives but i don't know i find the economic incentives a bit weird um tendermint on the other hand is a consensus protocol it's like a way of doing it's an alternative to uh proof of work or they're, they're like chain-based proof of stake systems Tendermint is a way of coming to, uh, it's a consensus algorithm. Uh, why I like, had this comparison between Trubit and Tendermint was like there are two different ways of solving the problem that like like clients suck, on-chain like clients suck, uh, proof of work like clients suck. Because the problem is they're expensive. Trubit says, okay, you know, we're stuck with these proof of work like clients, let's figure out how to actually like 
do them somehow on chain, like and like so that it gets like a small group of people to do it and stuff. Tendermint, we just said instead of like trying to f fix the problems with uh, proof of work like clients and like let's just like make it better, like like a better system than proof of work. And there's like other benefits, of course, to Tendermint as well. Like you know we're not going to kill the environment. Um, yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned about the concept of the hub, which you're coming up with. Yep. You also talked about like if you deploy the double spending. Mm -hmm. So how does that kind of work there on the hub? Because one hub has to probably broadcast. Um, so the hub prevents double spend between the chains that are connected to it. So it will say that, let's say the it, it knows that the uh, current supply of Ethereum is <coughs> this, right? Um, we can kind of like abstract out how it knows that, but um, it'll say this is the supply of Ethereum, and it'll you send it to, um, or you know it's actually easier with non fungible tokens to explain. So it'll say that you know this non fungible token exists on Ethereum, and Ethereum sent that non fungible token to Ethereum Classic, right? Yeah. But what if Ethereum now does a rollback and says I have that asset again? And then Ethereum will send that asset to Bitcoin. But the hub will say, no, 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 I, I kept track of where that asset was. I know it's on the Ethereum Classic chain. I don't know who on Ethereum Classic owns it. Uh, because if I, if I kept track of who on the Ethereum Classic chain owns it, then I'm not really solving any scalability stuff because I'm basically becoming just like single blockchain. But if I just keep track, I know someone there owns it, someone on Ethereum Classic can claim it later on. Um, I prevent the chain from double spending the other chains, and then I leave it to the blockchain to make sure the, to like people aren't double spending others there. But that's not my issue. So the same information is actually distributed across all the hubs. Um, so it's it's there to like protect the chains that are connected directly to this hub. Um, but yes, hopefully over time, like it will. S yes, you could. Yes, there will be ways to like court like. The kind of relationship between hubs is not known yet because we haven't seen many, any any hubs yet. The Cosmos hub will be the first hub in this system, but like the question is like, will hubs connect to multiple other hubs, or will there be a very like, like for example, what I mean by this is, this is not a good eraser. So it's like okay, so we have this. System right, four hubs, and they're all connected to their like own little chains. <coughs> okay, um, so the question is like, you know, will everyone base? Will there be this system where there'll be like cyclical paths? Because like, if cyclical paths show up, how to resolve double spends across these cyclical paths is kind of difficult. But maybe we'll just see it that in the ecosystem we'll only have like systems like with no cyclical paths. This would be, if, if this is the case, then the double spend problems are not an issue as long as each, because in that case, another hub is just, this hub is just another zone. It doesn't care what's going on like beyond that. It just cares that, you know, it's just another chain that's connected to. If we have these cyclical <coughs> paths show up, that'll be a harder problem to figure out what to do in those. So there could be a single point of failure for this hub, right? One of the hubs, if they're not cyclic? If it's non-cyclic, then yes, there's a single point of failure in the system. Well, there's many single points of failure. But, you know, the goal here is that these hubs should be extremely secure, and the hubs are themselves are, like, decentralized blockchains. So it should be very uh, reliable, and, like, a hub should not be able to go down. It shouldn't, yeah. Yes. Is the oh, concept of uh, exchange rate between different uh, chains. So the relative value of each has changed over time. Does it affect the, the system at all? So there's these. So there's no exchange rates involved here because there's no. We're not talking about like trading tokens or swapping tokens. I'm not like I have Bitcoin on the Bitcoin chain. I'm not trying to get Ether on the Ethereum chain. I'm trying to get my Bitcoin on the Ethereum chain. It'll be an ERC-20. So there's no like exchange rates or anything involved here. What will probably end up happening is you'll have like a zone 
we call, by the way, we call these like chains that are connected to hubs, we call them zones. You'll have like a zone or a chain that's like a DEX zone. And so, you know, people want to trade on tokens from different chains. I totally see like, you know, let's say this is like a zero X zone, right? I'll move my Bitcoin to this chain and my Ethereum, to e your, you'll move your Ether to this chain, my friend will move his Litecoin to this chain. And like, there'll be a lot of like trading going on here. And you know, it makes it, the Cosmos model makes it very easy to build these like DEXs from between tokens from different chains, but like that's like an abstraction that like that, that that's something that like application developers will build, and there are already a number of people building um, DEX chains on, on Cosmos. Yes. So would uh would different chains be prevented from connecting to more than one hub? Because if you're connected to two hubs, then you could fight the uh, double spend protection that you were talking about, right? Yeah. Uh. Yes. Uh. So as a zone, as a chain, you should avoid connecting to multiple hubs. Uh, if on, all, all that you're doing, all that will happen if you do connect to multiple hubs, just know that you're opening yourself up to double spends. Right, like, like if you're a user of that chain, you're opening yourself up to double spends. Aren't you the one that's been able to double spend? Who are, who are um, so any so IBC. You could, send, uh, you could send like hub one, I'm, you know, sending my Bitcoin to that chain over there. And then hub two, I'm sending my Bitcoin, that same Bitcoin to that chain over there. Um, right, but, but okay, so maybe another thing I should include is that as packets are relayed across, I guess we didn't go much into like the, the higher level of IBC, with, like as packets are relayed across multiple chains, they should like, there should be a differentiation between a Bitcoin that got to you from like, okay, let's say I'm on, Okay, I'm, this is like the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, this is Cosmos Hub, this is uh, Polkadot, um, and this is the Ethereum blockchain, right? When I get tokens from um, Bitcoin to like, when I send it to <laughs> Ethereum, technically that uh, token on Ethereum should not be ERC-20 Bitcoin, it's really hub Bitcoin. So there will be a difference between like hub BTC and Polkadot BTC. And so technically these are not like fungible. Like so I can't return, if I want, to, if I try to send like hub BTC to Polkadot, it won't actually become like BTC, it'll actually, what it'll be now is actually um, Ethereum uh, hub BTC. So it actually it's like it's like an onion. Like if you if you keep sending it farther down, then it will get more and more wrapped. Uh, if you send it back down the path it came from, it'll get unwrapped before it's back to like the most fungible thing. So you know, if I try to send this to Bitcoin, it's not gonna like unlock and give me Bitcoin. It, it, it'll say you need to come back down that route you came from. And so by building this, um, you know, it depends on how much trust people have in the hub and Polkadot. So if they have equal amounts of trust in them, then they should be like, you know, worth at par. They should be relatively fun fungible with each other. But if people think that like Polkadot is awesome, but the Cosmos hub is like terrible and untrustworthy, then the Polkadot BTC will pro like probably be worth more than the hub BTC. Um, Yes. Um, doesn't technically, I guess, as long as these, for example, they could be run, the Cosmos Hub and the Polkadot Hub could be run by the same DAO data set, and in that case, the, those could actually be treated. Sure, as but it, I don't want to think about like, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Shared validator set stuff makes this a bit more complicated. What it really is, it's being, and it shouldn't be, it's not being prefixed by the chain name, it's being prefixed by like the validator set. Hat. Validator set. Or the, the concept of that validator set. Um, but yeah, so like this is why, you know, I think the bet like most and so the longer your um, prefix like on onion the bigger your onion gets, like it's it's like a worse user experience like because 
if people want to trade back to get back the fungible thing, they have to do a long trace back. Um, like the more it gets, like you add more trust into your system, and your thing, your lo your longer path token like becomes less fungible with other path tokens. So that's why like the, the claim is that like we'll end up seeing ecosystems and where mostly you have a relatively shallow system where most things connect directly to like one hub and not don't have to worry about these things. Um, and usually things should hopefully like you know if Cosmos has we have an incentive to like promote the Cosmos hub. Right, and so we want there it to be relatively shallow, where things should mostly just be like hub, BTC hub ether, and not have to go down these convoluted paths. Um, yeah, but the the, the 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 that's the idea of why we made IBC super like general purpose, where it can be used for uh, by other systems. So we're already working with like Polkadot on getting it implemented into their system. Um, and so you can even, maybe like we're completely wrong and this like ISP model is not what ends up happening and it's going to be purely like chain to chain P2P. Uh, if that works, that's great because IBC is like general purpose enough to support that. So I follow that, but then I'm not quite sure how to answer my question. If let's say that BTC is connected to the Cosmos hub mm -hmm. and it's also connected to the other one that you mentioned, the PD. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Cosmos Hub has Ethereum on all, yeah. so, ones, right? So I'm saying and that then the, uh, the PD has, I don't know, So Ethereum on. should hopefully only be trusting one hub. It, yeah, but couldn't, so couldn't the Bitcoin chain send the same one to, so not to Ethereum. Yeah. Not double spend the Bitcoin towards the same chain. Yet? It'll double spend the hub, the other hub. So, yeah, so send Bitcoin to Ethereum through the Cosmos and send that same Bitcoin through the PD to I don't know, Tcash or some other chain. Yes, it could. And that's why, like, as users, you should not be trusting uh, chains that are, like, doing these cyclical things. Right? You want to avoid, so there's Zcash here, right? So maybe Zcash wants to make the single choice that we're only going to connect to Bitcoin. In that case, Bitcoin is acting as it's, like, single connection. You should avoid things that try to... It can do this if it wants, but the issue is if it ever tries to do that. That's not good. As yeah. a user, you have... To, so there's the concept of source zone, so where tokens are originated from, and as a user, you always have to trust the source zone of the token that you're using. So if you want to use a Zcash token, uh, maybe it's an idea that you at least want to run light kinds against that zone. You're, you're trusting everything in the path, and the source zone of a token is like innately in the path. Like if you're trust, if you're taking ether, you have to trust the Ethereum blockchain. Like they might just inflate the supply out of like, like to a, a billion, and so yeah, the source zone is always in your trust path. Mm. This cool stuff on a uh, Peggy. I don't know if any of well, you can just look at this and try to figure out how it works. <laughs> um, Tenderman's cool. Can everyone see the attendance URL? Good luck on finals. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Sunny, for that. Um, good round of applause. All right, folks, well, it's been a pleasure teaching you guys. We're going to have a feedback forum on Piazza later on just so that uh, we can get your feedback on how the semester went for you and where we can make improvements. Um, thanks very much.